Today, I want to talk to you about neglected tropical diseases, what's being done to address them, what's being done to eliminate them. But also, at a meta level, I want to tell you a story. And that is a story about what is possible, what we can achieve, when we work together towards a clear and common goal. So what are neglected tropical diseases? I think I'm gonna hold this, it might be easier. So neglected tropical diseases is a term applied to 17 bacterial and parasitic infections that afflict some of the world's poorest and most vulnerable people. They have names like onchocerciasis, schistosomiasis, or lymphatic filariasis. But behind these hard to pronounce names are horrific diseases that result in profound disfigurement, disability, and social stigma. Neglected tropical diseases, or NTDs, are diseases that keep the poor poor. They afflict people who live without access to clean water and sanitation and without protection from vectors that transmit the diseases. The linkages are quite clear. Poverty makes people susceptible to disease. Disease causes disability, leading to, econo to uh, economic um, issues and loss of productivity, which then leads to poverty, and the cycle continues. But there's also another layer to this vicious cycle, in that children with NTDs are more likely to have learning disabilities. And because they are sick more often, they also tend to miss more school than children without NTDs. So you can see that NTDs have a long-lasting impact on people's lives and it affects them throughout their entire lifespan. The scale of the problem is huge. One in six people currently suffer from one, uh, at least one type of NTD, with an, an additional two at risk. There is good news, however, because on January 30th, 2012, the so-called London Declaration was made. 22 nonprofit organizations, governmental groups, donors, and the pharmaceutical companies came together to sign on to a bold and sweeping vision to control or eliminate 10 of these neglected tropical diseases. They made pledges which included increasing the drug donation programs of new funding for close to $800 million to support elimination efforts. They also pledged to improve the drug distribution and implementation programs. And then finally, they also pledged to share resources, to share expertise and new compounds, to catalyze new R&D for drugs and diagnostic tools. PATH is one of the organizations involved in the fight against NTDs. We are an international nonprofit organization headquartered in Seattle, Washington, and we take an entrepreneurial approach to tackle global health problems. Public private partnerships is core to our approach, and we try to achieve our mission through five platforms of community based interventions, devices, diagnostics, drugs, and vaccines. We work through the entire full spectrum of technology development from early research, concept development, to introduction and scale up. We advance innovative, high impact, and appropriate diagnostic tools. But we don't do this alone because we can't do it alone. And it will take more than just technology if we want to achieve the end game for neglected tropical diseases. We need partnerships and we need effective partnerships in order to do this. So how can we proceed? Well, first, we need to work with the endemic communities. And we need to work with them 
as equal partners and not just as beneficiaries of whatever new technological intervention we are trying to propose. Secondly, we need to continue the work of, um, of partnering with the private sector, such as the drug companies who donate the medicines for the NTDs. We need to continue to partner with non-government organizations and other implementation partners who design and implement the different programs alongside with the ministries of health of the endemic countries. And I believe that with sustained commitment from all parties, we can achieve health for all. Now, I've been talking about this as a framework for how we can tackle NTDs. But I also want to convince you that this is really possible. And indeed, it is happening now. And for that, I want to tell you a little bit more about onchocerciasis, one of these NTDs. So this is a scene that used to be quite common in many of the countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, especially in West Africa, where blinding onchocerciasis was, used to be common. They used to have a saying in the Volta region of Ghana. They said, the river eats your eyes. And the reason for that is because onchocerciasis is caused by a parasite which is transmitted through the bite of the black fly, which breeds in fast-flowing rivers. To give you the scale of the impact of onchocerciasis of these communities, these are some photos taken in the 60s of Ghana. About 38% of the country was deserted because people fled otherwise perfectly good, fertile agricultural lands for fear of the disease. And they had very, very good reason to fear the disease. Because onchocerciasis is a particularly insidious disease. It is caused by the parasite, Onchocerca volvulus, transmitted by the bite of the black fly of the species Damnosum. And the adult female worms can grow up to 15 inches long and they live up to 14 years inside the body. And they produce thousands and thousands of progeny called microfilaria. Now, the microfilaria live in the subcutaneous layer of the skin, and they're the ones that cause these clinical symptoms. They cause an inflammatory response in the host, and you get skin rashes and lesions, an intense, unbearable itching, and over the years, skin depigmentation. But onchocerciasis is also known as river blindness. And the reason for that is the microfilaria also migrate to the eyes. And there, they cause an inflammatory response and other complications that over the years lead to blindness specifically over the times when people are supposed to be the most productive in their lives. Now, a very, um, a, a way to treat this disease came from an unlikely source. Back in 1978, a senior researcher at Merck by the name of Dr. William Campbell made an intriguing hypothesis. He thought, at that time, he was working on this experimental compound called ivermectin, and they were investigating the drug for use in horses. Now, he made an interesting and intriguing observation. He thought, hey, could this compound also work for humans suffering from river blindness? So he sent a memo to his boss, um, Dr. Roy Vagelos, then the head of R&D at Merck. Um, and it provoked a lot of discussions. Because if Merck, were to take this on, it would mean that they will have to invest millions of dollars to make a safe formulation for human use. And they will have to conduct field trials in some of the most remote parts of the world. And even if they were successful and they created a safe and effective drug, virtually none of the people afflicted with the disease could afford to buy it. 
So should they take on the gamble? And thankfully for us, they did. And in fact, not only did they make the, they take on the risk, took on the gamble, but in 1987, Roy Vagelos, by then the CEO of Merck, he made a stunning announcement. Mectizan, which is the brand name for ivermectin, will be donated to everyone who needs the drug for as long as it was needed. This was a historic announcement. Until then, no pharmaceutical companies ever declared any commitment of this scale. And to give you context for this decision, here are some numbers. 180 million people at risk. 37 million already infected, 300,000 people blind. And there's more. One thing I did not say is that Mectizan is a microfilaricide, which means it only kills the microfilaria. It does not kill the adult worm, which I mentioned earlier, it lives for 14 years inside the body. So it means it's not about dropping in, parachuting, giving the drug, and then say thank you, bye-bye, and leave. No, they have to go to those communities every single year for the next 10, 14, 15 years. So even if you've checked off the problem of drug supply, how do you start tackling distribution? Who will distribute it? How do you get access to these communities? So in order to address that, Merck set up the Mechtizan Donation Program. And the formation of the Mechtizan Donation Program catalyzed the formation of new organizations that sprung up to distribute the drug. These include OEPA, for the distribution and coordination of uh, coordination efforts in Latin America, and later on, APOC, for the distribution of the drug in Africa. So where do we stand now, 26 years later? Since its inception, the Mectisan Donation Program has donated over two billion tablets and now it's donating 140 million annually. And this summer, Colombia became the first country in the world to declare itself free of oncocerciasis. Ecuador is gearing up to be next, and Guatemala is ready to come right after. And after the Americas, there is real hope that the same successes can be achieved in Africa. This is a paper that came out, it was a really big paper when this came out, when they said that even with just ivermectin alone, they are able to uh, get the first evidence that elimination is feasible in Africa, specifically in Mali and Senegal. So, as you can see, in order to get to a real and effective change, all the different parties are involved. Technology is critically important. Now that's why I have them there in the middle for the drugs and the diagnostics. But all the different parties need to play their part in order to get the technology to achieve its highest potential. And as we move from purely control efforts of these MTDs and onto the elimination phase, new tools are needed, new diagnostic tools are needed. Because indeed, actually, there are certain epidemiological and entomological challenges that make control of onchocerciasis much more difficult in Africa than in the Americas. For one thing, sheer numbers. Greater than 99% of the cases for onchocerciasis are in sub-Saharan Africa. And secondly, we have this logistical problem that humans and flies tend to move around a bit. <laughs> um, but you can see that in the regions um, in the Americas, many of the infected areas are isolated foci. So you don't have as much movement of migration of flies and humans between the infected areas. But compare that to Africa, where all of that shaded area, that's, that's, those are the endemic countries where you have these vast transmission zones, and it's very clear that you will need cross-border coordination efforts in order to control the disease. 
Unfortunately for Africa, the species of flies of um, simoleon, they are much more effective in Africa um, for transmitting the disease as compared to the species found in, in the Americas. And then another issue um, for the control of oncocerciasis in Africa is there are these countries such as Cameroon, Chad, um, Central African Republic, where there is this infection with another microfilarial uh, worm called Loa Loa. And in areas where there's co-endemicity between Onchocerciasis and Loa Loa, it becomes a problem to distribute um, Mectizan in a mass drug administration format where entire communities take the drug. It's because people who also have infection for Loa Loa, they get the severe reaction to Mectizan. In fact, so severe, in some cases, depending on the worm burden, that they can go into coma or shock and death. So you can imagine that if you're trying to distribute um, Mectizan to the entire community, you need to know who has Loa Loa in that community, which makes logistics much more difficult. And then finally, and not to be diminished whatsoever, it, it's, it is much harder to work in Africa than it is in the Americas. Um, we're talking about countries like Southern Sudan or DRC. And euphemistically, in some places, we, we call the, the post-conflict areas where you know, you're talking about places like Liberia or Ivory Coast, where years of civil war really ravaged the country and left very little infrastructure intact. But you know what, amazingly enough, despite all of this, Africa is marching towards elimination. It's actually happening. Um, and in fact, there is much success now that the programs that are implementing, they're turning back to the research community and asking us, so do you guys have tools that we can use so that, you know, we've been doing this mass drug administration for, in the same communities for the last 10, 15 years. Do you have tools that we can use in order to gauge whether we're successful and when it is safe to stop giving mass drug administration? And secondly, after that, can you also give us tools that allows us to monitor these communities so that at the slightest um, indication that infection might be coming back, we can act right away and stop it before it gets a foothold in the community and before we sentence the community once again to take the, the drug for the next 10, 15 years. So at PATH, we believe we've developed a tool that can address these two questions. We're calling it the OV16 rapid test. Um, it's an easy to use, field friendly test. Um, rapid results in 20 minutes and only uses a finger prick, um, whole blood a sample. We have made certain designs that allow it to be read um, at 20 minutes, but also after an hour, after eight hours and thereafter. Um, this actually became an interesting and important point for the officer crisis community as we figured out the logistics of how they operate in the field and quality assurance programs that they need to put in place. We have found the test to be quite robust and stable. It's great. It's stable for over a year at 45 degrees Celsius and also at what we call cycling temperatures. Um, and because it's an antibody detection test, it does not need to be timed with when the drug is administered to the population. So what is the OV16 rapid test? It is a, serolo a serology-based rapid test detecting human IgG4 antibodies to the Oncocerca vulvalis antigen OV16. It detects exposure to infection, but it does not detect the active parasite itself. So you know the expression that sometimes to go fast, you have to go slow. Um, in the early stages of the of the project, we took a lot of time to identify and engage with key stakeholders and gatekeepers of the community to really understand how they're practicing, what, what are they doing in the field, what are their issues, and what are their constraints. Um, we, we, in fact, after um, in addition to many hours of interviews, we also um, repeatedly asked for uh, invitation to be able to shadow some of these teams as they went out and did their epidemiological surveys to really have a sense of, okay, when they arrive at a site, how do they set up? What's their, what's their workflow? I mean, what, how, when do, 
how many people come in at one time? Is it all 200 people of the village coming at once or they trickle in? So to just to understand the workflow logistics. And all of that information, we distilled down and identified use cases and identified target product profiles that meet these particular use cases before we went into any kind of design. Um, after that, we did a lot of rapid prototyping. Um, we have our own laboratory facilities in Seattle. And we, we, we failed a lot at first. Uh, we did a lot of iter iterations on prototyping um, to figure out which particular set of variables we needed to tweak in order to reach the, the optimal um, performance of the prototypes. And we did all of this with a lot of user feedback. Earlier this year, um, we launched our field evaluations um, of the beta prototypes in Togo. So we have um, a sample size of close to 1,500 participants um, in 15 villages up and down Togo. And our current status, and this is actually one of the one of our technicians um, doing the, the testing, um, is uh, we're, we're done with the field-based data collection and we're doing the reference testing of the of the prototypes um, and the composite references in a, in a laboratory in Togo. As some of you may know, it's very difficult to export samples from countries, so we have to do uh, a lot of our reference testing in country. Um, and we expect to do the data integration um, later this year. So we're forging ahead from prototyping to field evaluations. We're currently at the stage of technology transfer we have selected our manufacturing partner, signed the commercialization agreements with that partner, and um, if everything goes well, and according to plan, then we expect to launch the product by end of next year. Um, in parallel also, we have been working with a number of groups um, for operations research. This include, of course, APOC, who is currently the one who has the mandate to um, control and eliminate onchocerciasis in Africa. We are collaborating with APOC as well as the Task Force for Global Health to conduct operations research in order to generate the evidence base from which guidelines and policies will be drafted. And that will then pave the way for individual mini ministries of health to make the decision of whether or not to use the test that we are developing. So I'm very privileged to talk to you a little bit about onchocerciasis and the role of PATH um, in this story. Uh, my group works on a number of other um, diagnostic technologies on several diseases, but I think I'll leave that story for another time. And this is the onchocerciasis team who's actually doing all of the work and a long list of collaborators and partners. And finally, I want to thank you for your attention.